Welcome to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Street Ventures, where we talk to top experts and seasoned investors to help provide clarity and key insights to keep you safe on your journey to financial freedom. Our goal is to help you get educated on how to create passive income for you and your family using real estate as your vehicle. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and a written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. If you're tired of working the nine to five grind, missing too many key moments in your family's lives and looking for a way to be financially free in three years, then listen up. Aspiring real estate investors, I'll give you my exact multifamily playbook that will get you financially free in three. And if it doesn't work for you, you pay nothing. Vertical Street Ventures Multifamily Academy is a hands-on coaching program that teaches you from start to finish how to buy, raise capital, and run multifamily apartment buildings as an active investor. It's designed to accelerate your goals so that you can be financially free in three years. With this program, you'll get group mastermind sessions and office hours with industry experts so that you learn from the best, unlimited one-on-one coaching sessions with our lineup of experienced coaches so you can avoid costly mistakes, be part of a highly motivated, driven, and like-minded group of individuals. It's a built-in ecosystem of other folks motivating each other to reach their goals. Attend two in-person training and networking events where we do case studies, bus tours, and build on these relationships to get deals done and an opportunity to partner on deals with VSV and leverage our resources to get your foot in the door, where we walk you through the entire process from start to finish and partner with you on these deals. How do you know this could work? Our students have worked on over $300 million of assets across the country since joining our program. We've partnered on five deals with our students this year alone, where we walk them through the entire process from acquisitions to asset management. This is an opportunity to get you out of the rat race So visit us at vsvacademy.com to schedule time with us and learn more. Welcome back to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast. My name is Peter Pomeroy and I'm your host. Today we have Don Spafford with us. Don is a partner at Happy Camper Capital and has a professional background in finance and securities investing. He bought his first investment property, a fourplex, in 2017, then two more properties 18 months later. He moved into commercial real estate, including ground-up development projects, and eventually joined Happy Camper Capital, providing syndication opportunities in RV campground resorts. Within five years of becoming an investor, his net worth grew from literally nothing to over $1 million. Don, welcome to the show. Thanks, Peter. My my pleasure to be here. All right. So um, we've got a lot to get into, so let's let's do it. Um, Why don't we first start? you know, creating some context uh, around, you know, your journey. Uh, So if you could share your story and maybe kind of where you were when your net worth was around zero and then like what happened along the way for it to grow, um, you know, so incredibly. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, So, yeah, it's kind of incredible. So, so, so we'll back up a bit. So um, as you mentioned, you know, I've been, uh, my background is in finance, uh, investment science, portfolio management. So, that was my career path to kind of go down that route. My, my, my I guess, initial plan was to become a financial advisor uh, or portfolio manager, so something in the realm of of, of investing securities. Uh, but when the 2008 market crash took place, and I saw all these big companies either going out of business or laying off everybody, I was like, maybe, maybe that's not where I want to do. You know, <laughs> then I saw there was not as much security in that job as I guess would have thought there was, uh, and so it kind of scared me off a bit. So. Um, at that time, I decided to actually go back to school and, and get an accounting degree. Because uh, I, I, at the time when I was looking for jobs, everything I saw was all accounting related. So I'm like, well, it looks like accounting will su- survive, you know, any market collapse because people still need accounting. So, so I actually went back and got an accounting degree with the plans to get a CPA uh, de- designation. But um, I studied for it, but never took the test. Uh, kind of same with, with with this security stuff. I studied for the CFA exam as well, but uh, just you know. For me, the at the time we had very young children at home, and, and it was very hard for me to to set aside the time needed to study for those exams because uh, it does take a, a lot of, of time. Uh, and so I was not willing to, I guess, sacrifice my my family just to, to study for those things. So I kind of just put it off for a while and, and um, decided just to just kind of to get my head in the sand and <laughs> and keep st- at least at the time I had a job that that was secure. I, I was I'll figure I'd just stay there and and go forward and see what happens, but. Um, but it wasn't too long after that 
when my wife actually became a realtor around 2012, uh, early 2012. And um, mm. she started working with investors as some of her very first clients that were buying properties and in, in, in many cases, buying them in cash, uh, essentially doing, doing the, the burr strategy to, to buy them, fix them up, refinance them and, and uh, you know, keep doing more. So that really intrigued me. Uh, I, I saw that as a unique opportunity. Something I never considered before was real estate because it's not, you know, in, in school with all the classes I took about investing and, and finance, nothing really talked about real estate much. Um, so this was kind of new to me, but I saw it as a unique opportunity perhaps possibly. So I kind of dove into it and then started studying more and, and uh, learning what I could. Um, and at this time we lived in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, then it was around 2014. We decided we needed to move from Omaha to Idaho where we're at now uh, to help care for my mother. So I kind of put all that on hold for a while and uh, didn't focus on it. I was focusing on getting, you know, getting our house ready to sell and, and move here and figure things out. So after we moved here in 2015, uh, you know, took about a year or so to get kind of back into the the motions of uh, learning, I guess. And uh, you know, we went to a, uh, you know, I guess we'll say one of those guru seminars that came through town talking about, you know, house flipping and stuff. And um, it was there I met some other guys that were were since already doing it and really introduced me to, to bigger pockets, which was kind of really my I'd say that launching point. So I, I got into bigger pockets like the end of 2016 uh, and, you know, fell in love, I guess we'll say, you know, uh, I listened to all the podcasts, the webinars. I went through the forums. I used their calculators. Uh, I, I saw this was, uh, you know, really what was my, my starting point to, to get me motivated to do more, I think. Uh, and so um, March, 2017 is when I started. Well, no, sorry. So January, February, 2017 is when I started looking for uh, a property to buy. Uh, and that was that first fourplex that you mentioned. We closed on that in June, 2017. Uh, and that was really my, my starting point from there to, to have everything go forward from there. Uh, and just like you, most people are aware of like that law of the first deal, uh, that works for commercial and residential. I think either way, I mean, once you get started doing something, at least in real estate, I get back to the, the motivation and the, um, I guess just the, uh, the knowledge that you can do it to, to move forward and want to do more. Right. So uh, things really started to scale from there. Uh, you know, maybe not the way I had planned or anything. My, my goal was to keep buying fourplexes because I saw that as an easy way to go because I could get the long-term loans um, and they cash flowed decently at, at the time anyway. Uh, but as time went on and uh, there was more people entering in the space, becoming more competitive, it was very almost impossible to find something that I could, I could get to cash flow because uh, I would either get way outbid or the prices were going up so much anyway to the point where to me it didn't make sense. Um, and so I started getting to other things and other opportunities came up. Um, and, uh, I got some, some development projects, some land flips, um, got involved with a, a team that does build, build to rent multifamily. Um, so I got involved in, in one of those. Um, and then, uh, as time went on, I was, I was still trying to get into more commercial, like, you know, like your, your podcast, it was more about multifamily. I was trying to get more into multifamily, um, as a syndication, uh, either to, to find a, a, a multifamily deal I could take to a syndicator and, and, uh, be part of the team and help, you know, do all the, the steps and things involved, or if nothing else, just find when I could just invest in as an LP investor. Um, and, uh, so it, uh, for me, in a way, I, I was not finding anything that really stood out to me as a, as a great deal. The, the returns just were not, you know, juicy enough, we'll say to, 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 uh, to, I guess, deal with my, um, risk aversion. You know, I, I didn't want to put myself in too much of risk. Cause again, going back to w- the point at the very beginning, I did not have a, a lot of capital. I didn't have really any savings. I had, you know, that, that first property, like we said, I had really no, net worth really, or even savings that that first fourplex, I actually purchased using a loan for my 401k for the down payment and a local lender that has a 10% down. So I put 10% down, which most of that I borrowed from my 401k to buy that first fourplex. Um, you know, and, and, you know, luckily everything worked out well at that. And then I was able to do, do other things going forward, but, um, but just with other I- I- investments, things I've done with those development projects and things is what uh, kind of led, landed me where I'm at now to, to do a, a lot more. Um, but, um, so yeah, so I had to be creative early on, and, and uh, you know I couldn't couldn't just take on any risks to say just to get in a deal and have a deal, even if it wouldn't be that great. So so I was very picky about what I could do. As like you know, I had to had to be like a home run. Every single deal I had to do had to be a home run deal, pretty much. Um, and so when I was not finding stuff that that you know stood out to me as a, a home run deal, um, I, I would say it's not good enough. You know, I I wouldn't accept an average deal. Um, and so. It was about, uh, I don't know, June, July of 2021. So last year, uh, I'm sorry, not last year, but <laughs> we're 23 now. But but uh, June or July of 2021 is when I um, heard on a podcast that somebody else had mentioned RV campgrounds 
uh, as an investment option and and the kind of cash flow they were getting. And so that kind of stood out to me at the time. It just kind of gave me like a not quite a light bulb moment, but but I was like, huh, that sounds interesting. So I wanted to learn more because uh, where I live in in eastern Idaho, it's a, it's a high camping area. We're like an hour and a half from Yellowstone Park and lots of uh, you know outdoor activities around here. And so uh, camping is a big deal around here. Most of my neighbors have RVs or, or campers and uh, and go camping all the time. So I saw this as a you know a, a potential opportunity to, to look into. Um, so I went to say I went to these different uh, webinars and, and meetup events with people that are in that space just to network and get to know more. Uh, you know, kind of get my foot in the door somewhere or other, uh, and uh, in in mentioning something on uh, on I don't know if it was a LinkedIn post or or some other type of forum, um, I got connected with the the guys who are now my partners, uh, Adam Lendy and Justin Hoggett. Um, you know, I, I either I commented something or they commented on something. I don't know. And we got together, and uh, so we 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 connected, uh, discussed you know my goals and their goals and what we're looking to to accomplish and. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, they, you know, I look back and say, luckily for me, they, they invited me to join their team. They saw the value that I could bring and I saw the opportunities that were there with them. Uh, they had just closed their first property and were looking to expand and grow their team. So the timing was just perfect. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll say the stars aligned, I guess. And, and so I joined up with Happy Camper Capital at the end of 2021. And, uh, you know, I've been, uh, a, an integral part of the, the team ever since to kind of help really, uh, establish the, the brand and the name and, and get us out there and, uh, you know, be on uh, all these podcasts and things that I've been doing to help uh, spread the word, let people know that there are other things out there besides just multifamily. You don't have to accept what what you see, I guess, going around and assume that's the only thing out there. There's there's other options, and that's really what attracted me to this again was the the, the high returns, which I'm sure we'll get into in a bit. But um, it, they they far exceeded what I was seeing in anything else at the time, which is what really attracted me to the space. Well, that's great. I mean, there's a lot of lessons in um, that overview. And uh, there's you know kind of two things. Um, one, I, when I was a broker at Collier's um, in kind of the early 2000s, and the people who the brokers who were you know the most successful in terms of you know how many deals they closed and just always the consistency of deals, um, there was a little a phrase that they had or people had in the office which was niches to riches, mm-hmm. and um, you know I see that with. Uh, your your business at Happy Camper, but before we go there, I'm going to deviate from my uh, kind of outline a little bit. You mentioned in when you were um, looking to buy the the fourplexes and the fourplexes that you did buy um, that your you know I'm going to summarize that your underwriting or review of a property, a market, etc. That you couldn't find deals that made sense because your aversion to taking on uh, risk. And so my question, and maybe it'll relate to the RV size, and if it doesn't, that's fine. We can save it for later. But what, like, what metrics or what did you? What were the kind of some key things that you were like, you know, saying to yourself, "I'm not going to deviate on," or "I'm going to pay particularly close attention to," to uh, evaluate a property to determine how much risk you were assuming. Yeah, well, obviously with, with everything you know that goes with, with with stocks or any type of real estate or any any, any investment, right? There's there's risk in everything, no matter what. So sure. um, you have to look at the the um, you know I, I guess the risk assessment and risk risk level, the risk reward. You know, what do you want to call it? Um, <clears throat> so again, you know, early on those those first properties I, I bought, uh, I was looking for you know like the cash on cash for me had was the, pretty much the number one thing because getting cash flow for me was always number one uh, as I was trying to build up that extra income that I needed. Uh, more than anything else, uh, and so I was looking for properties that would get me, you know, at a minimum, say a thirty percent cash on cash or, or well above. You know, so like that that first property I bought, uh, when I bought it, even you know when I first bought it as is, I think it was it was you know I think it had a forty percent cash on cash. Um, it's since now exceeded that, and as of now, it's actually an infinite return. So I've refinanced and pulled out way more than I put down on it. But um, and the the second properties that I bought as a package, two two four packs I bought together, um, kind of a similar thing. They were around that range as well at the time when I bought them. Uh, at least on on paper anyway, right? So uh, the expectation was there. Uh, so so for me, it was it was like a you know, I'd say anything less than like a fifteen percent was for me not good enough. Uh, you know, and, and especially if it was like below ten for sure. Like you know, if there, if I saw there was a chance, okay, maybe it's it maybe below to start, but huh, I mean it's like well below uh, below rents. So it can get up you know within like a year. I can get to that number. Okay, I'll, I'll maybe look into that. But uh, if there was it was pretty low and likely to stay low for for some time. Uh, I was just not going to even bother because you know I didn't, couldn't take that risk if in case something would go wrong and maybe would never get there. Um, so so yeah, so I was looking for those high numbers. So so again, most of those multifamily deals I was looking at, 
in most cases the the, the cash flow they produced were were very low um like you know six right. to eight percent so i was like you know it's an okay deal i guess mm-hmm. overall but but wasn't good enough for for what i was looking for um because right. especially especially in, in the case where i would not have control if i could if I'd be investing as an lp investor and those types of deals were the cash flow was so low already and maybe even after five years there's only maybe a 2x multiple overall i'm like you know it's, it's okay deal i'm not gonna say it's bad but but it wasn't good enough for, for what i was looking for right so i mean this is great because and it's relevant to today um because what i hear you saying is the cash flow was like cash flow is king not appreciation cash flow and cash flow is what you know helps you pay bills it's also what helps one pay the mortgage and um, create you know additional reserves and that's uh, i think particularly important today with um regardless of what the product type you're interested in um because there's a lot of uncertainty and um um, you know, the idea that, oh, if it cash flows in 12 months because I'm doing this value add component, I think the the environment has changed completely um, where that might not be so prudent. So switching over to Happy Camper Capital, just like I was curious about your your business model in the sense of do you are you like sourcing properties and then raising the capital internally and managing, or do you work with outside partners that might be operators or whomever? Yeah, no. So we, we we source our own deals. Uh, we we are the the deal sponsors uh, of our campgrounds. Um, most of our properties we we are finding off market. So we are pretty much directly calling up the the campgrounds and talking to the owners and finding the ones that are willing to sell, and then from there work out a deal to find the ones that uh, are, are make make sense for the returns we're looking for for our investors. Um, you know, not to say that I mean so so. You know, I can't even tell you how many, but there, there's probably hundreds of deals we pass over that aren't don't meet our criteria, right? So we, we have very strict criteria for what we're looking for as well uh, to be able to provide those high returns back to our investors. We're not, we're not just grabbing anything out there. Say, hey, we've got a deal. Um, you know, as I sometimes feel is the case with, with some some multifamily deals I've seen, is like you're, people are just getting something just to say they've got a deal, even though the returns are very, very slim. Right. Um, so we're not we're not in that uh, aspect. We willing, we're going for like those, uh, you know, cream of the crop, you know, home run deals again every every time to get those great returns for our investors as well. Especially because this is still a relatively unknown niche, like like you're saying. So, mm-hmm. um, so not everybody's willing to in- invest in something like this right away until they understand it more. So we have to find those home run deals right, to get the, those higher returns to attract more investors to be willing to step away from what they're comfortable with to look into something new and different. Right. Uh, and so, then once they get, I think once they get a taste of it, they'll say, okay, yeah, this, yeah, this is yeah. worth yeah. come back for more. You know, that's a great segue. I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's a great segue. So <laughs> let's step back for a minute and and yeah. kind of broadly answer the question, like why why RV park? So and maybe we can frame that up with um, the biggest macro drivers that might compel somebody to want to learn more, go to your website, etc. Um, we'll start with that. Um, so, so, so your question was why, why RV parks? Right, let, let me, let me like <laughs> drill into it. Cause I saw, I found something yeah. that's very compelling on your website and maybe there's other stuff and I, maybe I, I wasn't understanding it completely, but like the, the, you know, on the website and this is, um, happy camper, com- uh, happy camper com. The market size is around 9.4 billion right now. And it's expected to grow to 12.7 billion in five years. And I was like, that's incredible growth. Um, and then there are some statistics on um, how you know more people are now saying, you know, what, instead of taking, I think you ca- you, you called it like a leisure vacation, you know, go somewhere a resort maybe. Um, we're now going to integrate, um, you know, uh, you know, going to an RV resort um, as an option, and then, you know, and then I'm just kind of intuitively like, you know, I, in, in my neighborhood, I see all these people with these uh, sprinter vans or whatever that are you know souped up to go you know, away from the city and there's all these apps now where you can rent an RV or, you know, and, and go somewhere. Um, like what's that? In, I mean, that's a bit like, that's a lot of like activity. That's a lot of kind of demonstrate like proof to me that, you know, these RV, you know, investing in RV resorts, like, you know, is sound. Is it, what, what else are you like, do you talk to your investors about in terms of why they should maybe take a look before you get into the returns and all that? Sure, sure. So, um, so kind of the point you mentioned that there's there's huge growth happening, and it's not just because of the the pandemic. Obviously, that the the pandemic definitely I think pushed things forward as as did with anything else. You know, things that were already heading in that direction just accelerated that 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 direction anyway, right? Like like Zoom calls, for example, that were already happening, but it, it definitely ex- exponentially increased it more rapidly than it would have taken naturally. Um, and I think in the in the campground space, it's kind of a similar 
in a way, but, but a bit different. So, um, kind of what you're saying is that, uh, you know, some of the things that are, are driving this, the, the huge growth and, and what's causing it to become more popular these, these days is there's a, a huge amount of new campers and RVers who are younger, like Gen, Gen Z, Gen X, Gen Y. Um, they're a big push in driving what, what's happening. Uh, and so it, there's a few reasons for that. Again, there, there's because, partly because of the pandemic, people could work from home more, more remotely or from anywhere. So a lot of people now, if they can do that, uh, if they don't have other responsibilities to keep them tied down to, to live in whatever town they've been growing up their whole life, they can now travel the country and live someplace new every week or month or however they want. So that is one option. So, so people are, are doing that. They're, they're living this life on the road, uh, living out of their RV and, and just enjoying, you know, traveling country and, and doing that. Uh, and then you got to also the parts where uh, in the last couple of years, the home prices went up so high and so fast that uh, people couldn't even buy a home. So if, you, if they can't buy a home without, you know, extremely overpaying to the point where that's all they could ever do, uh, the next best thing, again, for some of these younger couples or families is, hey, go just go buy a, an RV or camper or your, like your sprinter van, like you're saying, and kind of live that RV life kind of on the road. It's going to been a, a popular topic for, for many of those uh, influencers on social media. They live that RV life or van life and uh, and are doing that. And that's kind of a, a big drive of, of what's drawing these younger crowds to there. Uh, and then with that, that's kind of part of what we do is we're, we're adding on the amenities that they need and they're looking for. Now, they're, we're definitely, um, I, I guess, uh, drawing in much younger crowds than than in, we'll say, previous decades of, of campers where they're mostly, you know, older retirees, most likely. Um, in this case, it's more family and, and young uh, young person, <laughs> I guess, uh, attractions that, that bring them there, right? So I've got, you know, water parks and um, you know, all these fun features and, and attractions. And of course, it's good, strong Wi-Fi for people that are working from home. So let me uh, just, let me just that, ask you know? a question. You mentioned water parks. And, and yeah. so are those what, like on the actual like campground or like close to you're close to a water park or like all of the above? And this is, gets at like what like what value <laughs> add amenities do you have to attract people to come to your site versus somebody else's? Sure, exactly. So. So, yeah, in, in most cases, if, if uh, you know, if there's we, we love having water features on the property. So if there's a, a large lake, for example. We'll, we'll put a, a water park on it. So it's basically one of those, think of like a inflatable bouncy house thing, but on water, right? Pretty much. <laughs> so we got those and we're, or even on land with some splash pads or other things, you know, pools. Um, the, the other attractions could be, we, in some cases we'll have, uh, in, in some of our locations, we'll, we'll put on a, a concert venue. So we'll have like a, oh. a amphitheater or something to put on like, you know, weekend concerts or summer concerts to, to bring people there. Um, you've got, you know, possibly horseback riding trails and things, ATV trails and things. Um, you know, it's, there's almost unlimited upside potential of anything you could possibly do there. Um, and so, and again, it, it's not just only RVs as well. And most of our properties are going to have some glamping spots or cabins or even just dry tent camping spots. So, so you don't think you have, if you can't go there because you don't have an RV. So people that want to come out for, say, for a concert event, for example, they can come there, stay at a cabin or one of the glamping spots overnight if they want to stay for the concert while they're there, spend money on other things, you know, go play on the lake or, or, you know, rent a boat or whatever it may be. Uh, so all these different things are bringing additional income streams for the property as well. Um, you know, so, so there, there's a lot going on. Like, like you said, there's not just only your, your rental income and nothing else. You, you will, I'd say on, on average, probably about 10 different income streams per property. Uh, when you include all those other, you know, amenities and, and ancillary, uh, income streams. Oh, this is great. I mean, cause I like, you know, naively thought, you know, you're, you're on a country road somewhere. There's a river, you know, and this is what I've done. And then there's like a, you know, a site and you get a pad and that's that. Um, and that's, you know, can be fantastic, but what, what you're really doing is monetizing the land, um, that you, that you acquire to, you know, build these other attractions that might attract people just for the day, um, or night. And they don't necessarily need to have an RV, um, to enjoy, uh, the property. Yeah. Um, so is there, I'm just curious, you know, how in, in multifamily, there's like class A, B, C product and, or, you know, workforce housing, luxury housing, et cetera. Is there a, like a, a similar, you know, descriptor for, um, RV parks? Yeah, pretty much. There's they're still the different classes, but there's also, uh, we'll say different, um, types of properties, I guess it could be considered class as well, but. You know, mm -hmm. what we what we what we mainly focus on are, are like these vacation resorts. You know, so you get more of that uh, we call it the transient campers that are kind of there, come for a weekend or a week, or maybe in some cases stay for a full uh, season, like a summer or winter, uh, and then they go back to their actual home. Uh, or again, people live on the road; they'll they'll stay there for a while and move on to the next campground. You know, someplace new. But 
but typically not people that are living there long term. Like it's not like their home place, like a like a mobile home park or something. So with with the RV space, there are those types of properties. You know, so many of the properties you'll just see on, uh, especially like some of the southern states, like Texas, you know, Arizona area, they have a lot of those long term stays where, right. uh, especially people just live there and. Uh, especially places that have like you know oil workers or or, or uh, pipeline workers, things like that, where there's long term stay workers. Um, those are not the properties we go after. Uh, then you got you know what we what uh, are kind of like a side of the road type. Uh, you've probably seen you driving a highway, just a place you can just kind of pull over and park like overnight. Right. It's kind of like an in between destination spot just to park and 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 stay. That's also not what we buy because there's really not much income on that. Um. So so there's again there's, there's multiple different types of properties. Then you got the the uh, different levels of, of even the ones that are like a, like in our case like a short term stay there's different levels of those <laughs> so you got your uh, and we just want to get all the names of it but but essentially we, we, any property we're we're going to acquire our, our goal is it's still a value add we're going to still find ways to take it to that higher you know resort status level right right um, in many cases some of the value add we're going to do is, is includes an expansion so we may have a an existing you know 200 you know camp space you know between RVs or, or, or cabins and things. But we maybe will acquire additional ten acres and build out more. We'll add on more campsites, more glamping spots. Uh, possibly again add in like an amphitheater or a pool or something else that that has additional attraction to bring people there. Um, and, and then of course then then just just the the other upgrades to the property itself just make it nicer and, and classier uh, to attract those higher end like those you know it, it, you know think of like these uh, higher end like motorhomes that are like you know sure. like a million dollars or more. <laughs> you know th- those types of uh, of, of vehicles are not going to go into your standard, uh, we'll say class C type property right, that right. can't even handle that size, you know? So, uh, <clears throat> so we'll do all these different things, including even the upgrades of the, the connections itself. So, um, in many cases, the, the, um, the, uh, electrical connections where they're going to hook up to, uh, are, could be from some, from some time ago. So they may not be even up to, up to code for today's standard. So if we're going to be upgrading those anyway, we're going to put them up to, uh, an, an even higher level that can handle now electric vehicles that are starting to come through. Uh, they can pull in there and, and plug in and charge, uh, but also handle those that don't. So it's not only an electrical charger and nothing else. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a two-way type uh, type of connector. They can either plug in electrical or plug in regular. So you um, guys are, I mean, you guys are, 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 have a very focused like, you know, property type target and a very focused business plan. And, um, you know, you're executing on that. I think that's, I mean, it's, you're taking a niche and then you're getting more narrowly focused yeah. on, you know, and that's to our, you know, kind of first comment that you, you know, we were talking about how you would um, look at properties that had strong cash flow to de-risk. I mean, what you right. what you're describing as a business plan and property, you know, acquisition and criteria, like further, I think de-risks the investment. I want to just, I want to switch over to investors really quick, your investors. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, and, and. You know, sometimes I ask, like, what are the attributes of your investors, common attributes? Another way of, like, asking the question, and we can just hit on this. We don't have to spend too much time on it, is, like, you know, who is this investment for? <laughs> right? So, yeah. and just your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if you're asking who's our investor, I also, I wish I could give you a single answer, but, but it, the, the, honestly, we have a variety of, of investors that come here for different reasons. The great thing about these these campgrounds is, uh, investing with us is, is it's not you know one thing only like we're the the great thing we're able to provide great cash flow but also great equity multiples you know so people that maybe don't even care about the cash flow they're getting it anyway but they're also going to get that equity multiple they're looking for as well um, so so we can kind of hit both sides of what people need if they want cash flow now or they just want the equity multiple um, and uh, on top of that you know it, these are properties you can actually go to and hang out with and have fun with, right. you know so right. you <laughs> if you're invested in a multifamily or self storage something you're you're Probably not going to be living there. You're not going to go hang out with your friends in the parking lot or something. Right. So you can't really do much with it other than say, "Hey, right. I'm invested in that deal." Now, these ones you can you can uh, of course get those great returns, but you can also go there and and, and have fun, create memories and, and experiences with your fans and family. Um, yeah. So that's kind of a very unique experience that you don't get with anything else, really. Um, but yeah, so our ideal investor, I think for for the most part, I think I think most people I talk with that uh, are are really attracted to what we're doing is about the cash flow. Uh, you know, again, the, the equity multiple is great, but but the cash flow is really what can help people to achieve their financial freedom that they're looking for. Like even in my case, that was what I was after the whole time. So I needed cash flow so I could overtake my W two income to to kind of more fully, you know, do more of this or do more of whatever I want to do with my with my time with my family, rather than have to to work until I'm you know seventy years old. So I, I so so I think ideally people that are are 
kind of blown away when I tell them the kind of cash flow we're able to get. Well, that's that's, that's where I was going. I'm not used to seeing uh, it. <laughs> let it out, Don. Yeah. Let it let it yeah, out. Yeah. And I know just to be clear, this is just a you know hypothetical. It's not a promise. And I think you work primarily with accredited investors. Is that right? We do both, obviously. Okay, we, have, both. we have opportunities so, for both accredited and non-accredited. All right. right. So like just, you know, kind of pr- you know, pro forma, hypothetical returns. What like do you guys like seek? So our, we'll say our, our average deal that we that we target, right? So we're, we're targeting about an average of a 15% cash on cash. Um, so that's, you know, again, our average deal. We, we have had some that uh, have done well above that as well. So, um, but but uh, essentially that's what we're looking for. If, if we don't, if it doesn't even meet that basic criteria, like we're looking at average of even a 12%, we're saying, like, that's not good enough. You know, we, we'll pass on that deal and look for something better. So, uh, so that's kind of the target we're looking for is that, that about average of a 15% cash on cash. Uh, and with that, we also have like a, usually between a two and a half to three X multiple on, again, on our average wow. deal. So it's our whole time. So, uh, five years. So it's the same wow. you know, average five year whole period, like in most anything else, but, uh, you're getting way higher returns than you're seeing usually in, in other things. Wow. So now my next question, um, how can investors invest? Do they invest as individual LPs in a, in a deal? Or I, I saw that there's a fund. Is the mm-hmm. fund, like, have you moved to one versus the other? You know, talk to us about that. Yeah, so so <laughs> traditionally when we've done our, our, our deals prior to now, they, they've all been 506B. That's all we ever did was 506B for, for non-accredited investors. Uh, and we did that on purpose because we, we wanted to give more opportunities to people to become accredited investors, to get into great deals like these. Because typically these higher return deals, you don't, you don't, you don't, get into unless you're a credit investor only. So we want to have those opportunities available for everybody. Uh, we did create this fund recently. We just launched about uh, maybe two months ago now. Uh, that is a 506C fund for credit investors. Uh, and the idea behind this fund is to hold multiple properties in there. So we're going to have between five to seven properties probably by, by the time this fund is completed. Um, and the reason for that is just to kind of help um, stabilize the, the cash flow throughout the year. So again, like uh, any campground, no matter where it's at, north, south, east, west, there's going to be seasonality to it. There's going to have their, their peak season, their off season. So you may get great cash flow for, for two or three quarters of the year. And the other one, maybe not as much. Of course, the average throughout the year is still that 15% or above, but, uh, but some people don't like having a bulk of their cash flow in, in two quarters of the year. So, uh, so having these, this fund have multiple different geographical locations for properties, that's going to help stabilize that cash flow throughout the year is, is pretty much the, the main reason behind that, that fund. Um, but so, so whether, whether somebody's investing in the fund or an individual property that we may, we'll still do some other. Five six Bs outside of the fund, um, but they can either invest as an individual through an entity, you know, LLC or, or trust or whatever. We we accept you know self directed IRA funds, you know, pretty much anything and everything we we can accept. Um, we don't really do ten thirty one exchange into our deals unless it's a you know significant amount, um, you know, say that a million or above probably. Um, but uh, we we can obviously you know discuss it if if somebody has a need and we can find a way to make it work maybe, but. Um, we've done some JV deals with people, uh, you know, co-sponsorship. So we're, we're, we're flexible to make something work for everybody. Uh, you know, we're, we're the, our, our main focus is to get deals done and provide great returns to our investors. How we get there is, is, uh, you know, something we, where we can always figure out a way to make it happen for somebody that needs a special, you know, uh, purpose or whatever they have going on. Um, in fact, we, we've had many, uh, multifamily deal sponsors that have only done multifamily that, uh, have wanted to work with us because, uh, their the returns we're able to get, they want you to provide those returns to their investors as well. They they right. recognize right now they're not getting those returns in multifamily. So they're but they don't know this space well enough to go on their own, or they want to maybe not want to to look like they're switching focus, but uh, they still want to provide those opportunities for their investors to to get those returns in the meantime. So they're they're uh, they've approached us about doing some co-sponsor deals possibly. Um, so that's something we are definitely open to. We, we're open to discussing and and uh, finding a way to to make something work. That's excellent. Um, I mean, this you, you, I love this product type. Anyway, um, final two questions. So, I mean, you know, you've been, um, you know, you know, finding a team to work with and you know create value with, I think, can be really hard. It's kind of finding your home, if you will. Um, yeah. It took it took it took me, you know, three plus years with lots of trial and error, and and you know, thankfully, you know, I've I've done that uh, with Vertical Street Ventures. Um, what advice do you have for the investor who wants to be a part of a team and is having trouble getting traction? Well, so I was in the same boat. That, that, that was pretty much what I was focusing on on, on uh, early 2021 was um, I was trying to find, uh, like I said, either find partners to form a team or become part of a team, uh, do something to be more involved. And for me as, as being, <laughs> it may not seem like now, but, but especially back then when I was first starting out, I, I am, 
I'm still very much an introvert. So it was not easy for me to get out there and do that. But uh, I forced myself to get well out of my comfort zone to to make things happen because otherwise, you know, sitting home doing nothing, nothing's going to change, right? So uh, I forced myself, first of all, to become active on social media. So I was able to uh, start posting and, and being where regular people could see me and 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 see what I'm doing and understand. Um, and then from there, the, the biggest thing I, I did probably that I would say uh, people should do as well is just start networking. You know, if if I if there's not any in-person events in your area, or even if there is, there's not many probably, go to all these, there's lots of online meetups going on every day of the week, uh, several of them sometimes each day. So I was going to many different meetups throughout the entire year of 2021. That's pretty much all I did was just go to these meetups, get to know people, have them get to know me more importantly, because because the, the the biggest thing is people are not going to just come and find you, right? Unless unless you're already <laughs> have some type of, of uh, fame of some sort that people seek you out, uh, they're probably not going to come find you. So you need to get out there and be present, be seen, be known, uh, and just kind of tell people what you're doing and, and what you're looking for. If you say, hey, I'm, I'm looking to uh, find partners or be part of a team, here's what I can offer. You know, just getting out there is, is going to make that happen because either you'll find the right people or you'll find people that know somebody that's looking for that. So, hey, I know so-and-so, they're looking to form a team or they're looking to do this and there somebody's in your area, whatever. Um, you, you know, you, you've got to get out there and, and be seen and be heard for people to to know what you're looking for. Uh, and I think it's probably what, what you've done and that's what I've done. That's kind of really what uh, I think most people I know of, had, they've had to do that. None of, no, none of them just all of a sudden started a, a partnership with people they knew right there immediately uh, in most right. cases. It's more of, uh, you know, over time, finding the right people and, and partnering and, and slowly building a team a, as they go along. So um, and that only only happens by by networking and and uh, getting to meet new people. Excellent. All right. Uh, second question. Uh, like me, I know you have a strong faith. Can you share with us how your faith has maybe influenced or impacted your business career and, you know, the natural stresses that come come with it? <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's quite incredible, honestly. So. Um, yes, I'm, I'm very much religious, uh, and, and I hold my faith as, as a big part of who I am and, and what I do. Um, I, I seek guidance every day, uh, through, through prayer and, and, uh, read my scriptures and, and things like that with my family too. So, um, it, it, it defines who I am really, I'd say you know, who I am is reflected through, through my faith because, um, I've always been, uh, you know, honest and, and, uh, I guess we'll say trustworthy for, for people that, that, that know me, obviously that, uh, you know, I'm not going to do anything to, to, to pull one over on you. If there's something that I would not invest in or feel comfortable putting my money, in, I'm not going to ask you to do it either. So uh, I'm not here to uh, be a salesman and get you to invest in our deals and, uh, and, and nothing else. Right. I'm, I'm here to, uh, help people. Honestly, I, that's, you know, is I just, I guess we'll look at it like in the sense of, uh, you know, when you think of like missionary work or, or, or religion type things, it's like, would you found something that, you really uh, feel strongly about that, uh, you know, you think others would enjoy it as well. You want to share that with people. So that's kind of what I'm doing here. So I, I've, I've just, I've found this niche that can provide great cash flow to people that are looking for that extra income to help them get out of debt or, or reach financial independence. And I can help them do that much faster than any other thing else out there. I want to share that with people. I want to help people to, to see that and, and understand that there are options out there to make those things happen. So um, that's kind of what I'm, I'm, I'm here to do. And, uh, and I know it sounds hard to, to, or weird people to say it, but uh, again, part of my, my religion is that, um, I do not want to do anything that's going to defend God or, or my relationship with him. So I'm not here to, to lie, cheat or steal. Right. I, in fact, I don't lie. <laughs> it sounds weird to say, but I don't, I say don't lie. I, I can't do it. I don't, uh, I don't swear. I'm not going to ever treat people unfairly or badly. Um, cause I, I treat people how I want to be treated myself. So. Uh, it is a big part of what I do, and uh, it has, I think, guided me a, a lot. In many of my decisions led me to this point: is um, relying on 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 my faith and trusting in, in, uh, in my heavenly Father to to guide me and help me to, uh, you know, do the things that not only are best for for me and my family, but put me in a position to be able to help others and do more to help others uh, with my time and and the resources He's He's given me to to do more, to give more, and so um, so yeah, it's a big part of who I am. Thank you. That's uh, very encouraging. Uh, Don, thank you for coming on the show. If listeners would like to get a hold of you, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So I'm very active on on LinkedIn. Uh, you definitely find me there. Uh, Facebook as well. Um, but uh, you can obviously go to happycampercapital.com. Uh, if you go to the About Us tab on there, you'll find my picture name. 
click on that and then you'll see also a link to schedule a time to have a call. So we can uh, right there, schedule a, a Zoom call if you want or a phone call, whatever. And uh, we can schedule a time to talk. Excellent. And for those listeners who would like to connect with me or be on the show, please feel free to shoot me an email at peter at verticalstreetventures.com or reach out on LinkedIn. And as always, please consider subscribing to the show. And if moved, please leave a five-star review so we can continue to have terrific guests like Don Spafford share their insight with us. Thank you for listening. And I wish you all a great week. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. Subscribe too, so you can get the latest episodes. Lastly, to stay updated, head on over to verticalstreetventures.com. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, you can schedule a call with our team on the website. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode.